สวัสดีค่ะขอต้อนรับเข้าสู่เซสชันสุดท้ายของวันนี้นะคะก่อนอื่นเลยค่ะขอประชาสัมพันธ์ก่อนเพราะว่าหกโมงเย็นนี้นะคะเราจะมีเลคเชอร์อยู่ในฮอลฝั่งตรงข้ามนะคะของรองศาสตราจารย์วิวัฒน์เตมิยพันธ์หรืออาจารย์จิ๋วนะคะซึ่งเป็นบรรยายพิเศษร่วมกับอาจารย์ปฐมพัวพันธ์สกุลนะคะถ้าท่านใดสนใจก็จบฮอลนี้ห้าโมงเย็นไปต่อฝั่งนู้นหกโมงนะคะก็พอดีก่อนอื่นนะคะก็ขอเตือนทุกท่านอีกครั้งหนึ่งปิดเสียงโทรศัพท์มือถือนะคะซึ่งดีมากค่ะตั้งแต่เช้าเรายังไม่ได้ยินเสียงเลยนะคะก็แล้วก็เหมือนเดิมนะคะห้ามถ่ายภาพค่ะแล้วก็ถ้าท่านใดเซสชันนี้จะเป็นภาษาอังกฤษนะคะถ้าท่านใดต้องการหูฟังก็ออกไปแลกด้านหน้านะคะแล้วก็เปิดเสียงในระดับที่พอประมาณนะคะท่านใดต้องการ CPD นะคะกรุณากรอกฟอร์มแล้วก็เอาไปหย่อนใส่กล่องก่อนออกจากห้องนี้นะคะแล้วก็ถ้าท่านใดที่นำรถมานะคะก็ประทับตาจอดรถได้ที่ด้านหน้านะคะ uh, Before we start, um, please allow me to remind you to turn off your mobile phone. Any photo won't be allowed. And for those of you who use translating headsets, uh, please control the volume to an appropriate level. And for those of you who need uh, CPD points, uh, please fill the form and leave it in the box before you leave the room. And parking receipt can be also uh, stamped in the front of the home. And I think this is the time to start uh, the last session of today. Um, uh, our final session is uh, so ill. It's a New York-based design office found by Florian Eidenberg and uh, Jing Yu. And their work involved a delivery of extensive experience from architecture, academia, and the arts in all scale and stage in creative process. So ill principal uh, Florian Eidenberg received master degree in architecture from Dell University of Technology and is an associate professor in practice of architecture at Howard Graduate uh, School of Design. And principal uh, Jing Yu holds a master degree of architecture from Tulane University School of Architecture in New Orleans and she is teaching at Columbia University, GSAPP, and a faculty at Parsons. And their project under SOIL includes Sukje Art Gallery in Seoul, um, the 2012 Free Art Fair 10 in New York City, the Linket Community Center in Wuhan, the Netherlands, and Tri Colonies and Installation at uh, 2011. Uh, and the last one, Shenzhen, Hong Kong by City. And uh, so it has received um, a number of recognitions such as uh, the MOMAPS1 Young Architects Program for the AIA Young Practice Award in um, 2010, AIA New York Design Award for uh, Sukje Art Gallery and uh, Long Rogan's Office in 2011 and 12, and the Emerging Voices Award by the Architectural League in 2013. And I think uh, it is the time now. And please welcome uh, uh, both of them, uh, Foran Eidenberg and Jing Yu. Um, hello, good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> we're going to speak English, but uh, um, I think our English wouldn't be much better, maybe just a little bit better, because we are indeed very jet-lagged. It's exactly 12 hours uh, behind now our internal biological clock, so if we appear to be too relaxed, please excuse us. <laughs> um, so our office, uh, is soil and uh, we uh, and so Florian is a uh, Dutch um, born an architect I'm a Chinese born architect we met in um, Tokyo uh, working at Sana together and it, um, actually today during the lunch we were talking joking about uh, exactly 10 years ago Florian and I came to Bangkok actually I think it was also in May during the height of SARS because we were both so desperately needed a break from our very demanding bosses. So 
we escaped here to Bangkok, and uh, I think a lot of things has happened in the last 10 years. Today, we uh, yesterday we arrived in a different airport than uh, 10 years ago. Um, we also got married and had two kids, started an office together. Um, and uh, I think um, a lot of things happened in this country and also um, in the world beyond. And uh, um, I think compared to the last two speakers, we are definitely a generation that in age relates to most people in the back, you know, seats a little bit closer. And I think today I just want to, you know, talk about more from our generation, what are the issues that, um, that informs us as a creative um, people to make things and to create things and what are the conditions, social conditions and natural conditions that we face that um, um, is deeply influential to our work. Uh, let me see. So um, we started our office in 2008. As you may remember, um, that was uh, um, when the financial crisis hit um, New York first and then you know, all around the world. And uh, um, I think that, um, that, that was the moment that in, in the US at least, one third of the architects left their profession. Um, so, you know, a lot of the big firms lost their clients and the project, even it was under construction, got stopped. So there was a collateral of the financial crisis hitting the architecture world and many people were in despair and they were um, very, uh, they, they basically um, lost all hope in the profession. That's when Florian and I decided that maybe it's precisely intuitively the right time to start a new office because we did not have the pressure to produce buildings one after another as our previous generations did in the 90s and the, you know, during the 2000s. Uh, um, so we had the time to really think about what exactly we wanted to do, what exactly architecture um, you know, what kind of position architecture beholds in our society. And we also had the leisure and the time because we didn't have so much com commercial commissions to think about those questions. Um, and uh, it was also the time that a lot of natural disasters happened in the last 10 years. I myself lived uh, for a very long time in New Orleans, so I experienced um, uh, the tr Katrina, um, and uh, also when a tsunami happened in Japan, my family was, some of my family were there. And recently, um, New York also experienced the, the Sandy um, flood. So, and I think uh, most of you are very vividly remembering um, the disaster that happened here as well. Um, <clears throat> I think this kind of natural disasters also informed us to think about our relationship as a human beings pushing the boundary of kind of ever expanding civilizations and we're confronted every day with this kind of extend or um, the edge of our um, development and uh, um, its friction with, um, with our natural systems, so the other systems in our world. Um, so this kind of crisis together with also the financial crisis made us to really understand, um, well not understand, to really um, realize that we as an architect previously always said that okay we can make the world better we can control things and if we do this things will be come like this but we really cannot um, put such a claim on those questions we you know we can uh, almost with certainty we know that we cannot predict the future but we still have to make some things that would influence um, tomorrow. So how can we kind of operate as an architect uh, and build in a in kind of in a physical build form to um, react to this uncertain and ambiguous and more flexible and uh, more um, uh, uh, unstable um, society and in a nature system. And also it was the time, I think in the two, early 2000s, until early 2000s, everyone was very much embracing the new technology, the virtual world. And we always thought that the technology 
uh, would save us, not the save us, the, all the problems that we have in this world, the social injustice, um, inequalities and such would be solved in this new kind of world that technology is going to um, provide an answer to that. But I think we, you know, in, in the recent years, we have come to realize that um, the virtual world is just kind of a mirror to our own world that whatever problems that we encounter in our own world, in our physical space, is um, taking another shape in um, uh, it's kind of transforming itself into the digital world and the virtual world, if not more trouble. <laughs> um, uh, it's at least the same. And also we have a whole completely new generation that grow up with virtual technologies that their relationship with the physical world is completely transformed from our generation or the generation before. And that they see the world completely differently and they relate to each other completely differently. And in their world, the, the experience of their world is completely hybridized between the virtual and the, the physical. So you cannot really say that the virtual technology is going to save um, or solve the problem of the physical because you know, what, whatever they experience is a completely hybridized um, condition. So those are the conditions under which that we started practicing our architecture. Um, and I think as a new generation of uh, um, architecture firm, we were very much feeling the responsibility to explore these territories and uh, not finding an answer, but at least maybe find a new form um, um, of architecture that, um, that expressed that, those kind of conditions. So uh, the title of our lecture is called To Be Determined, and it refers to an attitude that we... Like I said, you know, we, we know that the future is to be determined, it's open-ended, and uh, um, it has this feedback loop that what, what, whatever we do would come back to us and influence us in how we think. So it's this constant feedback experience, and uh, we can never say that um, this is a finite thing that we're going to make, but rather we will make something that that, that um, deliberately is ambiguous and deliberately that leaves something to be uh, to be determined and uh, to be um, uh, influenced and uh, feedback on. So with that um, kind of context and story in the background, we want to introduce about seven projects um, in, um, in this lecture. And it ranges from a smaller scale installations to build project to, to project that's still under construction. And hopefully you can see a little bit of lineage of how, um, how we developed our thoughts. So this is um, an installation we did uh, for MoMA uh, PS1. So MoMA, the Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, Museum of Modern Art um, in Manhattan, uh, they have this uh, school, PS1, an old uh, public school in, uh, in Queens, which they use for their contemporary arts uh, programs. And every year, they, um, since 10 years, they've organized uh, the warm-up series, which is basically um, during the summer, uh, over a series of weekends, um, they transform the courtyard in front of the building uh, to make it a place for families um, and, and the youth uh, to hang out uh, in weekends. There's music, there is, um, um, there's a bar. Um, and it is, in a way, an alternative for people who can't leave the city to actually have sort of a beach uh, experience uh, uh, within, the, within the city itself. Um, and so since 10 year, years, they've, they've had this competition where they ask five um, architecture firms to basically uh, provide an environment for this program uh, to happen. Uh, but at the same time, they ask um, you, obviously, to uh, respond to uh, the state um, of today and to make an installation that in some way reflects uh, our, our current condition. Um, and so we were asked in 2009 to participate uh, in this competition, which was right, um, well, not much after uh, we started our office. And it allowed us to um, contemplate on some of these um, issues that Jing just uh, raised. Uh, because the, yeah, the initial program is very simple, provide a, a bar and provide um, a, a, a sort of a, a mitigate the environment. We were at the same time very interested in, in responding to the idea of modernity and the MoMA being in a way the, the treasurer, so to say, of the, of the modern movement of this idea of um, design and a design, the through design we can control uh, our environment, and we, we wanted to look um, 
in a way, at this idea of the, of the structure uh, um, that controls our environment, but find a way to respond more to this instable and uncertain and, and dynamic uh, condition. So we took the, um, say, the white modernist grid, the Cartesian white grid, as a symbol for um, uh, control, as a symbol for, for design. And we tried to see, can we make this um, responsive? Can we make this flexible and elastic and instable? Um, at the same time, the image on the, on the, for you right is uh, Oscar Slemmer. It's a, it's a, a Bauhaus um, choreographer, um, part of the MoMA uh, collection. Um, he examined the relationship between the human body and structure. And so we, we, wanted to have, we wanted to respond to these two conditions. How do we, um, as humans, interact with this uh, unstable condition? And what are the structures that we can design uh, for this, um, for this um, uh, yeah, new, new world? And so we decided to fill the entire courtyard with this grid, um, a, a, a white uh, grid on a six uh, meter uh, spacing. Uh, but we made it of uh, um, um, glass fiber poles that were uh, on pivoting uh, hinges and that were always actually moving um, as you would interact with it. The idea was that this is a metaphor for our uh, environment, an instable environment where we as visitors are actually responsible for its uh, stability and where one uh, movement affects and ripples through, through the entire uh, courtyard. We also wanted to respond to this idea of the virtual and what can we learn from the virtual and how can we bring some of the qualities from the virtual back into physical space and how can we have people and a younger generation in engage with the physical and with this physical um, uh, world. And so the idea is that we made this installation um, uh, that fills the entire courtyard and then we, we designed a number of activators of places where people would be stimulated to start um, you know, uh, activating this structure and seeing its uh, effect and, and seeing its um, uh, response to our, to our actions. So we, we, we suggested to MoMA to fill the entire courtyard with this system, a system always on the verge of collapse, uh, something that could, um, yeah, that could be uh, destabilized by the visitors. Um, which could sometimes be 5,000 drunk uh, uh, people. And so we realized when we would present this to MoMA that they would be somewhat concerned. Um, the United States specifically is a quite legal uh, uh, country. And so um, we, we realized that we needed to think this through. And so the day before our presentation, we called the Bureau Happel, the engineering firm. And these guys said, yeah, sure, uh, we will help you figure it out. Uh, but we didn't have time really to, to, to do a session with them. So we created this image um, in our computer, and uh, we presented it to the to the jury. We said this whole thing has been completely engineered. Don't worry, it will not collapse. Uh, and so we um, we won. <coughs> so we had the call bureau happled, um, and we said we won. And said congratulations. But sorry, what was your idea again? And so we explained this idea, and he said, well, what you do and what you want is the opposite of what we do as engineers, because. What we want to do is design uncertainty out of the system, whereas you are trying to increase the unpredictability and the instability of this environment. So this actually cannot be engineered. Um, all you can do is build it. Um, so the next day, uh, we went to, the, to, uh, to PS1. We went to the courtyard with a, with a bunch of uh, uh, surf mast uh, bases and a, a few poles and some, um, some elastic uh, rope, and we, uh, we started to test the, uh, the installation. So this looked very, um, very promising, so we went home um, happily. Um, and then uh, uh, we came home, and the next, uh, we, we got, a, we got a, fo <laughs> a phone call from the people from MoMA said, can you please come and can you please <laughs> start cleaning up the, 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 the mess you created. Um, but so through trial and error, actually over the course of a month, we found a way to, to calibrate the system and, and give it sort of a certain state of, um, of, of uh, flexibility and at the same time uh, a balance. And we worked through um, uh, and, and, and figured it out. And so here you see the installation um, with also a number of these activators, these, um, these uh, uh, elements that stimulate uh, interaction. 
And the balls that you see there, they were used to calibrate the system, and at the same time, they suggested a game. They, they sort of opened the system up for interpretation. They, there, wasn't, there were no rules. We actually invited people to come up with their own ideas. And so the system was an open system that invited uh, interaction in, in, in different ways. And so the images you see here were actually images we found online uh, showing how people started to interact with this open uh, system. And it became sort of a new uh, way to stimulate new sort of social um, relationships and we figured out uh, types of play that we you know we had not uh, anticipated uh, ourselves with this <coughs> this image we got um, emailed by one of the lawyers from MoMA uh, saying is this allowed and you know it was uh, it, it was up for uh, interpretation and, uh, and interaction in many different uh, uh, ways um, and so after um, let's see now I have to yeah um, so apart from, um, from this installation, what happened is that as soon as this project was announced, there were many people, and I will show only, um, we, we will show two, but there were many um, other creative people in New York that said, can we do something within this, uh, within this installation? Is there another way to, um, to, uh, to use it and to work with it? Um, and so you see the, the large courtyard um, over here, and then there's a smaller courtyard, which you see over here. We were approached uh, by Arab, um, their acoustical, um, engineers and they said can we make an installation there with sound um, th can th in a way that that sound would activate uh, the, the the environment what we did is we installed eight um, accelerometers which are these things you have in your mach in your phone that actually measure where something is in space into eight of these uh, poles and we connected them to speakers and so let's see it's very interactive so here you see the eight um, speakers connected to these poles. Uh, and if you would move the poles, they would affect the sound that would come out of this speaker. And then together with 2x4, uh, a graphics design firm, we developed an iPhone uh, application with which you could, claim these, uh, you could claim one of these eight uh, poles and you could start to affect the sound that would come out of the speaker. And so suddenly the thing became an instrument, uh, but it became also sort of a hybrid space between... Um, say the, the physical, very active environment there, and then your phone with which you could control um, uh, the sounds. And so you had people shaking this thing and at the same time, you know, trying to, to work on their phone to adjust uh, uh, the sound. And once we had that information, this information, this constant data flow of where things were in space, we thought maybe there's other things we can do uh, with this as well. So with the app, we, we, there was a second part, which you see here, which is uh, watch where there could be a live feed, a constant feed on your phone actually seeing this physical uh, environment being activated. And so suddenly my mom in Amsterdam, for instance, who had the app, could call me and say, are you there again shaking that pole? Um, if she was interested in that at a certain point. And so this is this, this hybridity of space and spatial experience that we, that we spoke about. Okay, so now we're going to move that project um, in um, MoMA PS1 is in Queens, which is here in, the, in this borough. And the New York um, has five boroughs. And uh, so this is Bronx, another borough, and this is Manhattan. And there is a land that I think even a lot of the New Yorkers don't know what this land is called, this island. It's called Randolph's Island. It has no... Um, it has no subway that runs through this island, so it's very difficult to get to unless you have a car or even the car, they drive on here and there's like one very difficult exit that you have to get off on that island. And there's a, like a psychiatric institute in there and a, a social security unemployment office and a lot of land fuel in, on that island. Um, the reason I'm giving you the history of this island is that um, you know, this is the only island that was uh, um, that doesn't have residential development because of the transportation and such. 
um, on this island, so it has no kind of a commercial interest for developers in um, in New York, and that's a very rare context. And uh, um, we we made a, a freeze art fair, which is one of the most exclusive contemporary art um, uh, art fair in uh, that started in London, uh, I think nine years ago. And so they came to they decided after the um, financial crisis, which was in two thousand eight. Um, you know, everything went down, the art market went down, um, but in 2010 and 11, people started to kind of, uh, the market came up and people started to kind of forget about uh, the issues that uh, we, we had during the financial crisis and start to celebrate the market again. And they, uh, Freeze Art Fair came to New York and uh, this is the only patch of land in New York that you can do a huge um, structure, like a temporary structure, and that's where they chose as their site. And so during the, um, with the crisis, obviously you know that there's the Occupy Wall Street movement and uh, um, a lot of other kind of uh, movement that talked about, and also the Arab Spring, and I would say like the mob um, that you have currently in, in, um, in Thailand. Uh, word. I, I don't know if it's a mob is the right word, but um, that you you know I think the crisis and uh, uh, has exposed a lot of uh, um, social issues in our societies, and that there were a lot of discussions about the claiming of a public space um, in in, uh, in our very kind of a neoliberal development um, cities around the world, and so um, when uh, Fritz came to us, they sorry. They, um, they showed us this um, task, which is, can you fit uh, 200 uh, galleries in this, uh, in this patch of land, which would actually mount to 500 meters of um, tent? And as you can imagine, you know, going through this kind of warehouse of just the biggest galleries selling like some very expensive artwork and so um, so daunting, you know, it's one after another after another of shaking hands and making deals and such. So we um, we got to the task and we said, you know, yes, uh, you can probably fit it, but you will um, make this experience much better if you start to um, provide also social space in this tent. And the, um, they wanted us to, to make some kind of uh, colorful um, elements and fun elements in this, uh, in this tent. But we said, why don't we rethink the tent? And the tent itself, we can maybe break it down into few sections so people wouldn't go into this very long kind of um, strip to warehouse experience and be so exhausted you know when you're like halfway through but we will break it into six sections and between each sections we would insert this public space that because you know if you know the contemporary art galleries they need the straight walls so in this uh, wedges they are, because they're not straight you cannot ever use it for um, for selling art so we will use this space to, as a public space where people can just mingle you know maybe they can go out and come back in there and maybe this space can also have um, uh, uh, transparent glass uh, or vinyl rather than the, um, the, when the tra translucent vinyls. So this is a very simple act of us kind of trying to insert or um, kind of assert a public experience in a very uh, real estate driven um, uh, project. So, and also that wedges that we made, we custom made these wedges to break this very straight um, and tent into a very um, kind of undulating, almost like a serpentine shape that related very much uh, well with the kind of uh, the curves of the waterfront in uh, in a, uh, in a, uh, ne next to the river. And what we also did, which the contractors hated us for that, is uh, um, typically you have uh, um, this. Uh, the tent is serviced by a lot of uh, trucks and uh, generators and uh, um, chillers and mechanical chillers and such. 
and uh, typically they're on the two sides of the tent because the tent is uh, 50 meters long. And we've asked them to put all the mechanical systems on one side. So they were able to leave one side of the tent completely free of uh, all the mechanical systems. So people can really go out from the tent and uh, use this space as a sculpture garden and project space for, um, for the fair. So on the inside, you can see that this is one of the wedges, the custom-made wedges. Um, and in here, people would uh, kind of have a rest, and uh, you know, some artists did, did projects here that's not for sale, and it's just for the public to enjoy, to see. And also, um, we brought in a lot of restaurants to, to occupy these uh, wedges, and these wedges, so each wedge would have a restaurant, and sometimes they, this is a... Uh, um, I think we need to speed up a little bit. We're already 30 minutes into the, into oh, the presentation. Really? Okay. <laughs> okay, so on some of the wedges, you can go out and there's a deck and the people would roast the pigs, which is a very popular thing to do in New York um, here. And also on the two ends of the, um, the tent, we made this very festive um, tent, uh, kind of vinyl structures. And, if you can remember, you know, when you're young, and probably you go to circus, and there's this always a kind of a very, you know, you don't know why it's there, but it's this, you know, kind of festive uh, gestures for uh, um, kind of some kind of exciting event that's happening. So we wanted to create that similar experience here as well, and uh, um, it was easy. Am I going to do the next? Oh, yeah, no, no it's me. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> I forgot, the, we forgot the order. Yeah, okay. So uh, the next project I'm going to show is the project that we did in Korea, Seoul, the capital of Korea. And the, the, uh, the project is in one of the oldest neighborhoods in Korea. In, I mean, in Seoul, it's right across the street from the, um, the palace. I think you need to sit here a little bit so I can point. <laughs> you can imagine how we designed together. Yeah. <laughs> So here, here is the site, and across the street is the um, palace. And uh, the neighborhood is like this, and it's a lot of the... Um, it's, a, it's called Hanuk. It's this kind of traditional courtyard houses with a very um, detailed um, uh, constructions. And so the brief was to have... Um, can, I, can I use it? Yeah. So this is the street where the palace is on the other side. The client has this three, two buildings already. The biggest building is their first gallery space, and the second one is called K2, their second biggest gallery. And uh, they asked us to do, do another gallery in the back. And you can see that on this road, actually, there are quite a bigger scale um, buildings. But uh, as you go back into the kind of uh, um, inner blocks, the scales start to break down to very small kind of uh, old courtyard homes. And uh, the building the client asked um, is a very simple gallery box, the biggest gallery box you, we can make. That's um, column free. And underneath this box, there's um, a theater space, the same footprint, and uh, underneath that, there's another kind of a office and a deal rooms. So we did exactly that programmatically. We give them the biggest gallery box possible, and we pushed all the other accessory um, elements outside of the box. And, uh, but this, um, this diagram is very, you know, the client was very pleased with our solution, very straightforward, but we thought that this diagram was too, um, too harsh and too, um, uh, too rational for that neighborhood, which is very refined and fine-grained. And we looked at the uh, Korean paintings and, uh, you know, a lot of the sculptures that we found in the museums there. And you can see, I mean, the Korean paintings are very similar to the Japanese and the Chinese old paintings as well. It's kind of a, somewhere between an interpretive poetic um, uh, gesture and the graphic gesture. So um, you can, in these paintings, you can see exactly, it's, it's diagrammatic in a way that they're very accurate. You know, each mountain relates to the actual mountain um, that's in, in, a, in, in, um, in the city. Um, but also, like, they're not the literal kind of uh, representation of that mountain. You know, it's graphic and poetic at the same time. 
and then you have this Korean um, vase that are f formally somewhat ambiguous. It's not exactly a kind of sphere, and it's not, you know, th there's something kind of in between about those shapes. So we thought, what if we wrap this diagram, uh, this three-dimensional diagram, in this kind of permanent ambiguous fog? And so we literally shrink-wrapped the building with, um, with a stretchable uh, material as a model, um, as a study model in our office. And our client, sorry, so our client saw it and that he, she, she's very you know, efficient in her communication. She says, I love it, make it. But we had no idea what this, what this facade was going to be. And then we scratched our head, but then we came across this um, image, which is a medieval armor that's made out of a chainmail mesh. And then we thought, okay, this is it. You know, this is a, a, exactly what we needed. Something very strong, but also very elastic and pliable at the same time. Why can we, you know, why, how can we scale it up and make it into an architecture scale rather than a human body scale? So we started to test in our office with, uh, you know, cardboard, laser cut cardboard with different scales. And then we bought some of the kind of belly dancing uh, chainmail mesh, um, you know, materials from India, and started to test the behavior of this material. Wait. Okay. And then, um, we, because we knew how it would behave, how it would stretch in different directions, we were able to map all this um, in our um, in, a, in our building. And uh, we then collaborated with an uh, engineer and uh, tested basically this ring at a different scales in a material lab and to understand how, at which point, the, the stress would break the ring. And then, you know, once we understood the, the behavior of each of the rings, we were able to, in computer, model out the entire facade's behavior um, on our building. By then, we knew so much about this hypothetical material or facade. But the question is, who's going to make it, right? Like, because it's not something that exists in the world and, uh, you know, there's no specification or companies that made it. So we went online. We went to alibaba.com. <laughs> and then literally we typed in ring mesh. And then we realized that, that there was this city called Amping, south of, uh, southwest of um, Beijing that they called themselves the, the hometown of mesh. And uh, uh, many factories basically came back to us and said, yes, we can make this. You know, you know Chinese, they're very you know, optimistic about things. You know, this can-do you know, attitude. Yes, of course, we don't know what it is, but we can make it. <laughs> And so we started to Skype with this girl whose name is Ring. We thought that was very promising, right? <laughs> uh, and this, you know, after a couple of emails, and then they said, oh, "We'll send you a sample." And so this sample arrived in our office after one month of interaction with the Ring, and we were super excited about it because it was the first time we saw something close to what we imagined in our head. And as you know, like, I don't know if you have any experience with meeting friends or boyfriend or girlfriend friend online. Uh, you know, after a couple interactions, it's a good idea to meet them in person and check out what exactly they look like. So we did take a trip to China. I'm Chinese, but I've never, I'm not from the north, so I've never been to Amping before. And we arrived after eight hours of a dirt road um, drive at this place, Amping. And I was, I have to say, I was quite shocked by, uh, by the conditions that we're confronted with. So um, Ring's factory, it's more like a workshop, was this. It's no bigger than this stage. And the, at the end of the factory, it's basically like a, you know, courtyard house, I guess you could call it. Um, at the end of the factory, there was a very young man in solitary. It's Ring's brother. Yeah. <laughs> was, uh, you know, one by one welding our rings together. And, and then basically I told the, the workshop owner, he's like, do you have any idea what we're trying to do here? We need 500,000 ring welded together and we have to hand it on the building. I think it, 
he he didn't know how to answer my question. And then there's the Florian and our engineer, you know, scratching our head at that moment. But you know, I think with any relationship, you shouldn't give up when you are first, you know, confronted with the differences and uh, you know, expectation, kind of a disappointment. So we started to, you know, but this is, Ampin was our only hope in delivering this building. So we started to work and, you know, like the workshop owners also said, you know, don't worry. I know that we cannot weld the 500 rings together, but there are many welders and many of them are my cousins in this, you know, this town. I'm sure together we can do it. <laughs> so indeed, we got a lot of, you know, workshop together and it, Indeed, everyone could weld in that town. So, but in order to quality control this whole process, we were, you know, we had to kind of devise a process with them. Um, so um, we told them to weld them individually, but then, you know, on this plywood um, kind of shelf, they would have to kind of put them all together in front of them so that they don't any make any mistakes. And uh, um, sorry. And so they will make the smaller patches individually, and then they will come together and make the smaller patches in bigger swatches. And if you can imagine, this is a process that cannot be mechanized, right? So it's literally 500,000 rings, all hand welded and polished like this, and they are all hand linked together like that. And then um, we rented a local car wash to make the acid uh, etching process um, because that's also not something that, uh, it's not a, a facility they had um, in that town. And in the, in the far right, uh, you can see how the um, big swatch then um, produced by the smaller swatches. And then we rented a local schoolyard to do the mock-up samples. And the, I think the local um, residents approved our mock-ups. <laughs> and then, so 14 of these swatches, what? 14 of the swatches arrived on site and was hung by the Korean contractors from above. And uh, you can see that basically there is a. Um, a parapet at the top that had the springs on them and they have to basically hand these rings um, uh, the mesh from uh, uh, the parapet and then it's tensioned at the bottom and then at the top again. So it's a very um, kind of intense um, hand made process from the beginning to the end. And this is uh, the building realized in the neighborhood as you can see that it's a very dense and a small scale f uh, urban fabric. So the building is really like a softly nested in this neighborhood. And you will never really understand, you know, this building as an object. And, uh, you know, when you approach it, it's somewhat kind of in the cloud and fuzzy. And you don't really uh, encounter it until you're really up close to it. And then you realize that the experience is very um, ambiguous and unpredictable. Um, it's almost uh, like uh, um, the opposite of what you would think an architecture form would be that it has a finite form on the outside and the inside is this very intricate um, spaces. This building is almost the opposite, uh, um, uh, that you, the inside the space is a very finite uh, rectangular gallery box. On the, on the exterior, you have this very ambiguous and uh, unpredictable spaces that are both the space and also the form of the architecture. Um, this is the stair that goes down to the theater space in the right, and uh, another um, deal, like a small gallery space, and the um, offices in the basement two level. And because, like I said, because of the handmade quality of this building, we were very happy with how this parapet, um, you know, with kind of very contemporary uh, materials related somewhat with the refinedness and the kind of details of the older um, buildings. And this curved kind of um, double curved soft forms also related very much well with um, the neighborhood um, buildings. Uh, 
Um, <coughs> At, at the same time, we were doing a project in, um, in uh, New York, which is sort of the inverse. It's, um, it's a company, a completely digital uh, company. They um, are called Logan. They, they produce uh, animations and they work, um, well, basically in the cloud. Uh, they have offices in uh, LA, and we were asked to do their, uh, um, their office in, um, in New York. And so what is interesting about this company that works completely uh, with animation uh, only, so they only work on screens, is um, that they are also a company uh, that only has four people. Um, but on their production, they sometimes have to work with 20, 30 uh, uh, people because they, they all work with, uh, with freelancers. And so we were asked to make this environment for them in which they could work, uh, in which there sometimes could be a very, a very small amount of people and at the same time, uh, they would be able to work in different groups uh, uh, with freelancers on like five uh, uh, projects at once with, with 40 people. So they needed a certain uh, uh, incredible flexibility and at the same time uh, it asked for how will these groups uh, work with each other and how do they relate uh, with each other. And we were very interested in trying to define how can we, like what is the relationship that people have within a virtual realm um, you know, with one another. And where maybe in the past glass was sort of a metaphor for a new sort of endless uh, um, uh, digital realm, we wanted to explore something that is maybe more accurate, which is basically defining these relationships in a more precise sort of um, series of realms rather than a continuous uh, uh, universe. Uh, so it's a, it's a small uh, project. It's basically um, a, an old Soho loft uh, in, um, in, in New York. So this is Grand Street, this is Green Street. Um, and as you uh, as you see, we 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 used the the grid of the of the uh, typical cast iron uh, building to lay out the space, and we we basically made two very long um, singular uh, tables, um, and these tables everybody could work on uh, uh, together. In the center, there's a very uh, strong um, uh, network uh, connection, so they could everybody could um, sort of plug in and 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 start to work, um, and there were no chairs. Um, or no, <coughs> no legs uh, at the table um, at the edge, so ba basically they could densify or, or relax the amount of people that would be working there. All the chairs are on, on casters. And then they needed one private space uh, for the director, which you see over here, uh, a meeting room, um, their uh, assistant of the, of the director, and a, a photo studio. So what we did is we cut those large tables with a glass wall uh, through the middle, uh, so people would still be working together. This is the space for the freelancers. And then there are a number of editing booths, which are completely controlled, dark uh, uh, spaces in which they do the final uh, mix. Um, and so then we <coughs> actually, rather than making hard uh, divisions between these spaces with, uh, with typical sheetrock, um, we gave these uh, a fabric uh, as a division. And this is a theater fabric that spans the entire length um, of the space as a single seamless sheet. And so what you start to see then is that the, the space beyond, um, there is a certain sense of activity. You, you actually realize that something is going on there, but, but at the same time you're not disturbed or you're not uh, uh, confronted actually with, with what is happening uh, um, in the space beyond. And also the old uh, building, um, which we wanted to have a present uh, within the space, appears sort of as a, as a, goat, uh, a ghost. This is the old uh, um, plumbing that is being used uh, still as, uh, as heat. Uh, and here you see these long um, uh, tables and on the right you see, um, you see the meeting room and, and the, uh, the editing uh, booths. And so this helped us think, as a, so another reason uh, was, was light control. So the entire space could be actually adapted to um, sunlight. Uh, actually I will go back one slide to show the, um, can I go back or not? I guess not. Well, anyway, we, we have to hurry up a little bit. So, um, no. So the entire uh, ceiling is also made of a stretched uh, fabric that can dim and, uh, and and brighten. So because the quality of the light on the screens was very uh, important for them uh, as well. And so here you see these two tables next to one another. And what is interesting is one sort of appears almost as a mirror um, of the other, but then suddenly you see somebody walking through one space, but not uh, appearing in this uh, in this mirror. Um, apart from that, uh, we, we do a lot of competitions, and this is a competition we did uh, in, in Belgium for a similar, I would say, audience, a young uh, audience. It's a museum of contemporary art. Um, it's a public museum of contemporary art in uh, Hasselt in Belgium, in the north of, um, of um, um, uh, the country. 
And what is interesting is it's, it's located in uh, an old, uh, beautiful uh, courtyard, sort of a, a hidden um, uh, cloister yard uh, in the center of this historic town. So here you see the historic city, a very um, um, typical medieval city with a very dense uh, fabric, beautiful old brick uh, buildings that have become uh, like the commercial center of the, of the town. So there's a lot of retail, a lot of um, uh, restaurants. And then there's this walled um, garden there where the uh, nuns uh, used to live. So this is the place where the, there was a cathedral or a church which was bombed in the Second World, World War and left... Um, in ruins as a, as a memory of, uh, of, of the violence of history. And this is where the, uh, the nuns used to live. They had their little houses and their little yards. Uh, and then after the war, they, they, they rebuilt this place uh, with a museum. Here in 1958, this museum was built um, specifically for, for art. Um, and in the 80s, they built a sort of a fake historic school there as an addition uh, to it. The only way to get into this um, uh, courtyard was through this old um, uh, building, this gateway building. And so the very dense commercial center, had, there was a big door, and basically the only way to enter the existing museum was through this uh, 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 courtyard, uh, through this gateway building. The scope of the project was to renovate the existing building. This school was being demolished and moved out and extend the museum over here by moving these spaces, which were used as galleries now, also into this uh, space. So an upgrade of the existing facility and an extension uh, to this uh, size. And we were, uh, th so the programming of this institute is very dynamic. It's a very active, um, young uh, audience. It's very much a sort of a do-it-yourself, um, I would say counter-commercial uh, also attitude. So they don't do shows about uh, uh, specific artists, but it is really shows about topics, about questions that are uh, uh, at stake in uh, society. Um, there was a need, because it was public money, to open up this museum to, to, the, to, the, uh, the, to the town. People couldn't find it. And so there was actually the question, can you make a you know, real uh, uh, gate uh, to, the, to the outside, to the, to the neighborhood, or to the, to the old center? But we liked this idea of the enclosure and the protection in some way that not everything becomes part of this commercial uh, world. And so we came up with this diagram which basically uses the wall, the walled uh, um, uh, sort of city um, uh, wall around this uh, uh, old yard um, as, a, as a filter, as something that transforms you, that changes you. And so this diagram uh, uh, tries to uh, illustrate the friction that we wanted to create with our uh, installation within this uh, space and so how it works as a, as a transformative experience. Um, the courtyard itself um, and, the, and the fabric of this uh, neighborhood or of this um, uh, uh, building uh, consists very much of just walls and openings. And so we, we were thinking, can we use this very simple um, organization of wall and uh, opening to come up with a new typology for this new uh, museum? A traditional gallery is organized, um, organizes its, um, its walls and openings in this way. So you get an enfilade uh, organization where you tell a story, a, a curatorial story is very literally from one room to the next to the next. When we said this doesn't fit with this new um, audience and with, with, which doesn't want the story to be told to them top down. Uh, they browse, they move through space in a different way. We cannot make a classic um, uh, organization like this. And we started to look at different ways of organizing. So if this is the classic enfilade, and this is maybe a more modern where the the space flows from one room to the next, but there's, it's a little bit more dynamic. Um, we, um, we, we, said we, we, we would set out ourselves to find something uh, different. And we then wrote uh, a script uh, that basically tries to very carefully calibrate exactly where um, the opening is, the size of the opening, the relationship of the, of the opening to um, uh, the room. And so if you see, this is the city and this is the uh, yard. We ultimately came up with a system where the, the, the openings happen uh, right at the corner, so at every alternating corner, um, and they gradually increase from the city to the yard, so that the, the fabric of the walls of the museum actually act as this filter that as you push through, you, you sort of uh, uh, create a more uh, open relationship towards the, the yard uh, beyond. And so this is what we settled on, uh, alternating openings right at the corner where the walls come together, and this means that you can get sort of a new, oops, it goes a little bit fair, a new uh, 
connections, but sort of on the, on the oblique, a visual relationship from the, from the city into the yard. And at the same time, every time that you come to, um, to the edge of a room, there's a choice. You can't just go on to the next uh, um, room, but you actually have to make a choice. You browse basically through this environment, and there's three possibilities. And this also changes the way uh, curators, for instance, can, can use the space. So suddenly, rather than telling a linear story, you can create sort of multiple storylines that, that, that happen together within the museum itself. And so we didn't want to make um, uh, an, just an extension like this. We wanted to affect the old uh, building as well. So we took the existing grid, and then we extended that into the new building, and we changed both the old and the new within this system to create uh, uh, yeah, this new spatial uh, experience. And so old and new come together, uh, not by adding, but by actually by taking away. And this created not a very uh, programmatically uh, precise um, uh, uh, building, but something that actually offered them a whole por portfolio of spaces, a, cat a catalog of rooms, all with different qualities so that they can use in different ways. They could use it sometimes as a, a gallery space, uh, sometimes as, um, it's a little bit of a delay. Um, so here as gallery space or as uh, education space, um, we didn't even provide gallery walls, just the concrete uh, structure that they can then uh, sort of take over and, and, and use as, as needed. And so here you see how you could organize exhibitions that work sort of as a, as a chessboard um, uh, installation. Even the stairs and what have you can be part of the, the exhibition experience as well. And then we broke up the volume of this uh, extension to make it fit better within the scale of the city and it becoming part of this wall of this fabric that basically um, uh, um, uh, filters uh, uh, this relationship between the commercial center of the town and this beautiful uh, garden uh, behind. Uh, we became second uh, in this competition. Uh, but it helped us think uh, about the next, which is a project which is currently uh, under construction, which is a museum uh, in uh, UC Davis in California. Um, and UC Davis is uh, a town uh, south of uh, Sacramento, north of San Francisco, in an agricultural landscape. And the school uh, of, uh, of UC Davis, the University of California, in Davis is mostly focused on agricultural uh, education. So they, know, they learn how to clone uh, animals and they know how to geoengineer basically uh, um, uh, uh, the, the agricultural uh, uh, production. And it's a very beautiful landscape, the Central Valley. Uh, and it is a combination of the, the sort of very agricultural uh, land and then this natural uh, delta um, of the Sacramento River. And this, uh, this coming together of the organic and the, and the, the, the cultivated uh, landscape. UC Davis itself, here you see the, the, the campus. It's a beautiful campus, very green with very uh, heavily uh, forested trees. Um, it's, the, it's the most bike-friendly community in the United States, so everybody bikes. Um, and so this is the, the campus itself. Uh, but because everybody is more interested in a way in, um, in agriculture and in uh, uh, engineering, there is now a need uh, to, to bring also a more cultural life to the campus. And so they build a performing arts center uh, over here. This is a wine and food culture uh, institute. And this is the site for the museum uh, that we are working on. And so the challenge was how do you, how do you get these people that are hanging out uh, here to the edge of campus uh, into a museum, what they're not normally used to uh, uh, being part of. The, the, the traditional museum was not something that these people would go to. Also, this is the highway uh, between Sacramento and, uh, and San Francisco. And so the, the project is right at the edge of the university and, and would become the new um, uh, symbol or icon, if you want, for this, uh, for this university. And so um, here you see, there's really a delay on this. Uh, so there is a, they have an art uh, legacy. Um, uh, Wayne Thibault is the painter you see here on the left, um, which is uh, sort of a landscape painter, but very, very intense and sort of um, uh, 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 colorful. And then Robert Arneson is uh, a very influential teacher who taught art at that school. And he's very much a counter um, cultural figure. It's a very uh, sort of anti, um, uh, he's sort of the anti Donald Judd, if you want. It, he, he re, he, he brought um, uh, the quirkiness, he brought ceramics back into contemporary art. He was the head of this uh, funk art movement. And so there's a very sort of offbeat uh, sense to, um, to the, uh, the campus and, uh, and the mindset of the, of the, of the people uh, uh, there. 
There's also this uh, idea of uh, a control of nature, the relationship between, say, the natural and uh, the cultural. In, 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 the mindset there is that we can bioengineer, so to say, the, the, the future. Um, and this picture, maybe people know it, went all around the world. This was also taken at UC Davis. Um, it was during the Occupy uh, movement. The most active students, the most critical students, and the most, um, uh, um, say, focused on what is, what is public uh, were at UC Davis. So this was the condition in which we had to come up with a museum. And so we didn't believe that we, we should make a static, closed uh, uh, box for, for a collection of art. Um, we thought we, we used this idea of the landscape of production, uh, sort of the idea, the, the, the landscape that is, that is empowering, that gives people uh, um, the possibility to sort of produce their own uh, story and their own um, uh, uh, future. And we used that as a, as a given uh, to, to design uh, the building. And so this became um, a leading uh, image, uh, sort of an open structure that is always changing, that is always um, becoming, uh, in which uh, the students can be sort of active uh, participants in shaping uh, their, their environment. And we started to work um, with this idea of, of, of creating a, um, yeah, literally a structure that would just sort of create a very open, um, uh, penetrable uh, uh, space that would rise um, out of the landscape, like that hill we just showed in this flat uh, landscape, um, covered in a, in a certain way, but as an open uh, uh, structure under which this very new uh, life uh, uh, could take place. A place where you would just go um, uh, to hang out, not necessarily to be confronted with art, but maybe where you could encounter uh, art. So we generated this diagram, um, and it was the grand uh, canopy, uh, a place where inside and outside would come together under this large uh, uh, roof. And so here you see this, uh, this open structure that creates a portfolio of spaces of different um, qualities of light and, and proportion uh, that the students can take over and, and sort of produce their own uh, environment. And the program itself, we, we loosely distributed again um, in this um, set of, of spaces, this catalog of spaces. Um, and so uh, a sort of this field condition appeared um, both inside and outside galleries. Uh, and I will quickly explain the plan. So there's a large uh, open public area, these are the galleries, there's courtyards um, and a central transparent uh, uh, entry hall, spaces for education and production, and here the offices and support uh, uh, space. And so the, the canopy itself um, slowly rising out of the landscape um, uh, and its profile um, actually being the new uh, sort of symbol of this place. The inside uh, galleries but always a relationship to the outside so everywhere in the building you can see uh, the exterior and the and the canopy itself actually forming um, the infrastructure the support for um, for art projects the building can be project projected on so the the, the canopy as a as an infrastructure for uh, for the students to take uh, to take over and then the the infill of this canopy became very important this is a image taken uh, last year when there was incredible drought in, um, in California. And we wanted to um, strengthen the awareness of the environment and the effect of the environment on uh, basically our, uh, our, our condition, our world. And so how can we um, integrate the environment um, as, um, as, a, as a way to create uh, awareness of, of space? Um, and we got interested in, in working with the shadow of this infill, so on the left you see the shadow of the trees on the campus. We, we thought, can we use this, um, the shadow and the shadow patterns to uh, create a heightened awareness of, of where we are uh, in, in, in this place? And we started to study uh, with models how we can control the shadow, actually control the shadow uh, patterns and the, the way you would experience the space. And so ultimately, we came up with an idea to transform the traditional infill of, of primary steel, secondary steel, and this perforated uh, material, and actually merge those two into one system where we basically fill the entire canopy in with these triangulated, perforated uh, beams um, that you see um, over there. And through changing the spacing and the orientation and the openness, we could calibrate the shadows throughout this canopy and create sort of spaces that are darker uh, and more shaded and others that are more open and more articulated. So there's this whole patchwork of different shadow patterns that will 
um, occur uh, under this uh, canopy and we're hoping that it will activate uh, 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 the spaces in their use and also that it will actually make people aware of the, of the environment as they move uh, through. And so here we see some tests on our roof in, um, in New York and you see that the multiple layers of material create sort of different ways in which the light uh, falls, falls through. And so from the, from the interior, the, the space uh, uh, underneath will be, you know, feels very activated while well as the, the top becomes actually more smooth and these lines, the original lines of the structure become more, uh, more legible. And this is a mock-up we recently uh, uh, did uh, on, on site. And so this is, we, we started construction um, and it will take another two years for this to be, to be built. And now Jing is going to bring yeah, it home. I'm going to just end with a very small installation you just realized um, recently. As Florian was saying, that, uh, that um, you know, the museum in California is going to take two years in construction. So, um, as you know, uh, compared to Asia, I think a construction schedule is always more relaxed in the U.S. and probably more relaxed in Europe. <laughs> Uh, so, on the, at the same time, we typically do a lot of uh, smaller scale installations that, with which we can test uh, much, much more quickly some kind of just material innovation or some kind of ideas we had, like um, a PS1 project that we had in the beginning that informed a lot of our thinking for the subsequent project. So, we keep uh, um, experiment at the smaller scales and hope that all the smaller experiments will add up to something um, big, you know, that can be realized in a much bigger scales. Um, this is a, 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 the new Museum of Contemporary Art for SANA, which Florian worked on um, when he was at SANA. And uh, um, the, the facade is this expanded metal mesh, uh, which is a pretty typical um, building material. And it was also at the same time we were experimenting with the different roof structures and a different kind of uh, shading devices for the UC Davis. And uh, um, the Chinese um, National Architecture Biennial came to us to do um, to do uh, 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 installation in a bird's nest, I mean, uh, outside of the bird's nest. So we thought, okay, let's experiment with this material because we are very much interested in, you know, something that with uh, a material might maybe, you know, that has one form, which is two-dimensional, and with a very simple um, method or very simple process, it transforms into another form, which can be like three-dimensional or such. So something, you know, that something complex or uh, unpredictable that can come out of something really simple and uh, um, uh, um, elemental with very simple processes. So we uh, took the same method of how you would make expanded metal mesh, which is just simply cutting a pattern um, in, in that sheet and uh, stretching it. And we experimented with different patterns. What if we do a radio shaped pattern that had a kind of a gradient uh, of density to it? And, uh, you know, if you just stretch that, it will become this cone shape um, out of this sheet material. And uh, so, um, as you know, the same in China, that they always like to experiment things even when they <laughs> don't know what it is. We asked our fabricator to try it. And I think they broke about the three of them before they finally was able to, uh, to, to get one unbroken. And, uh, and the beauty of this uh, kind of uh, this experiment is that we ordered 16 of them to be made. So they were on laser uh, water jet cut on, in the factory. And then they can be flat packed in a container, just like, you know, very um, efficient way of shipping this sheet material. It's two and a half meter by two and a half meter. And on site, it's almost like opening an umbrella that you would open it up and then link it together and immediately you are uh, you you end up with this very fascinating and uh, you know kind of you know um unexpected canopy space um we we didn't expect that they were going to ward off this you know this uh, installation we were hoping that people would be underneath it and then see the reflection and the light coming through it um, and they really experience it but i think as you can see it's a little bit framed as an object 
at this moment. But underneath it, you know, you get this very, you know, amazing, um, unexpected kind of a shadow and a light um, experience. And I think uh, with that, this is, yeah, this is the end. <laughs> yeah. Thank with you. that, we're going to end <laughs> our lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, both of you, for a wonderful presentation. And now it is a Q&A session. And I would like to invite uh, Kun Supaporn Vithyat Hawan Wong as our moderator for the session. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. And I was just told that we only have 10 minutes, so you guys are going to have to talk faster. Yes. That's important. Well, is that possible ever? Anyhow, um, well, I feel that it's um, sort of worth mentioning that um, actually the six or seven projects that you guys um, chose to present today represent um, only a small portion of, of the body of work that, that you have. Well, basically, their um, online portfolio um, amounts to 105 pages. And, and it, it includes um, not only built projects, but also you know, beautiful, conceptual, um, unbuilt project um, writings, essays, um, what else? There, there's a lot going on there, and um, I, I just feel that, um, you know, for members of the audience who are not entirely familiar with your, with your practice, this, this should be um, given as a big picture. Um, so, with all those elements, all those components of your, of your practice, I, I was just wondering if you can explain a little if... Um, or how they interact. Like, for example, why is it important that you will need to keep working on com um, competitions? Or what is the role of writing in, in your practice? Hmm. Well, those are, I mean, that's a very broad uh, question. But basically, I think the question, yeah, OK, sorry. Uh, faster, yeah. faster. <laughs> Um. <laughs> well, I think indeed, I think uh, during Peju's uh, session, someone asked the question, you know, like, uh, is your project between art and architecture? We have that uh, similar question always asked in, to us and also, you know, our office, we, uh, we talked about, you know, are we architects? Are we, what are we trying to do here? And I think, you know, everyone can be an artist, right? Like, architect... Really? No, I think <laughs> if you really want to, everyone can be an artist. In a way, like, you know, it's about, you know, having an attitude and then trying, to, uh, trying to do something, uh, try, trying to relate to our human existence, you know, like to answer those questions. Um, it's already an artistic approach to something. And I think for us, we always try to, we obviously we're trained as architecture, uh, architects and then we work with architectural kind of uh, scales and materials and uh, you know, spacing in our societies and urban spaces and architectural issues. But in a way, we use architecture to, to answer some questions that's a little bit bigger, you know, that kind of, Yes, I mean, that's, that's it. We use, architecture is a method almost for us as our writings and as our, our performance art, art pieces, you know, like that we do with museums, that we try to use architecture as a, as a tool to answer some questions that relates to our, you know, existence, basically. Mm -hmm. um, if um, there, there are questions from the audience, please um, write and, and send over to the stage and we'll try to accommodate in... Um, ten minutes. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna shift the tone a little and 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 give you an observation of mine. And mind you, this is way far from intellectual. Okay, <laughs> um, I'm gonna talk about about cats and dogs and kids and baby strollers. Um, 
well, we when, know that very well. <laughs> when when I read um, your project descriptions, the textual descriptions, um, images of these, you know, kids and dogs and cats and baby strollers popped in my head. Um, it tells something, and and well, indeed, there are images of of this ensemble in in your project illustrations a whole lot and even horses or um, maybe chicken in some in certain case but <laughs> and a giraffe we have a giraffe, giraffe. Also, yeah yeah well i missed that one but um what well, the point is that um <laughs> well this 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 really rings my bell um and it brought me back to to um a, a wise professor's of mine's advice to um, she told me to put kids and dogs and baby strollers and um, birds chirping in in you know my white on white kind of perspective and and at that at that point in my in my academic career um, n no living creatures were um, allowed to be in in <laughs> my perspectives, and, but the point is that um, that it's not. She she wasn't talking about anything graphics, obviously. But w what she was trying to say is that the world would be a better place, or would do better with um, the human, more of the human-centric species of architects, as opposed to the egocentric kind, and. Um, I, I know that architects hate to be cubbyholed or categorized, so, but, but still it's itchy to ask that um, would, would you agree or would you protest if your work is being called, um, say things like anti-monumental, um, anti anti-iconic, anti-heroic, I think we are interested in how we relate to the world around us. So I think we put um, us as beings in the center of the project and then try to see how we can organize physical stuff around us so that we realize you know, our place in relation to others or in relation to the, to the world, um, to the environment. I thought you were going to ask, are you a cat or a dog person? I think, uh, I think Jing is a cat person. I'm a dog person. Oh, good to know. Yeah. But I think there's a hero, heroism in it, too. <laughs> well, I, I think I recalled a, a phrase, local heroism, somewhere in your writings. Can you elaborate a local little? Local heroism? Yeah. It's your own yeah. word, yeah. writing. <laughs> um, let's see. No, I, well, I think if you speak about the, the non-monumental... Um, I don't know, we're interested in a, in a, in a lightness, we're interested in a ambiguity, we're, we're looking to find ways that we can create spaces that, that people can relate to from different um, positions, from different backgrounds. What we, what we, I think, try to shy away from is the over um, uh, conceptual, sort of, if you don't get it, you don't get it type of approach. So we're trying to make things that actually, uh, PS1 is a good example of an of a open, uh, system which everybody can find a way to work with or interpret it or make their own. So we're trying to make make you know, places and in installations and spaces that people can uh, um, uh, take in and observe in their in their own uh, way. So I don't think we're trying to be too um, determined, so to say, in what we're trying to make. Well, exactly. This tied it back to where you started. You, you mentioned um, starting the practice in 2008 at the onset of the. Um, economic crisis and, and this to be determined mentality, the openness to the unknown, to the, um, and, well, open to, to possibilities for events to happen, for, um, you know, the, the unanticipated. And, and that, that is seen, well, pretty much throughout the body of your work. And in pole dance, um, it, it is, very, very obvious, and, but, but somehow it's portrayed in a really fun way. Well, think about um, where, where it started, which is sort of gloomy, but, but you managed to, to you know, turn a project out in, in an optimistic way. Um, 
But what, what's the question? <laughs> but, um, I'm, just, I'm just trying to like, well, um, say what's the... What's There's the, a question. Let's see. In the, yeah. Jack, come on, Jack, Jack give us a question. Yeah. 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 This is yellow. Very short question. Yeah. Uh, Very short questions. Um, and please don't find it insulting. Uh, it's okay. It's, it's a question about color. Why is it white? Why are they all white? We had a very pink building that we didn't show today. But <laughs> we have a pink building. Yeah. We have we a pink building that I think even Wall Street Journal said, wow, this is the most contextual pink building we've ever seen. So we're not just about white. But we don't want to make a color the center of a discussion. You know, sometimes if it's contextually colorful, it's fine. Um, yeah. I right, just want to link it a bit to, to your past experience, like working experience with Sana, because obviously it's somehow a little bit kind of colorless or white. So does it influence you somehow, influence your work right now? At PS1, we first only had white and black uh, balls. Um, but then actually our daughter suggested we use some uh, color. So she picked uh, the colors of the balls. And I think, um, I, I think from, say, the, the past, the, the, the qu color is a very difficult question, basically. And maybe you can ask more about texture. I think many, I don't, I don't know, you know, which architects are, except for maybe somebody like Barragan and, and later in life Corbusier started to really actively understand uh, color. But I think color is a very difficult and complex uh, uh, question that maybe we're not ready for yet. Um, I think uh, uh, texture is another. And I think what we do try to do is not have, because we're interested in how to organize space um, or how to organize relationships between different you know, spaces and between people and, and say, the world beyond. Um, texture and material can get in the way, if you want. And so by reducing maybe um, elements that, that can distract from this relationship, that's, that's probably the reason why we're maybe toning down other aspects to highlight this one uh, element. Okay. Any more a question. question? Uh, I think you try to unorthodox things. When people do museum one way, you do another way. When people talk about engineering, and engineering have to be stiff and safety, you try to make it non-safety. Is it uh, that's a that's a core of your your thought? When when we start something, you start from, I have to do something different. Is it that the way? I mean, I want you to teach all the other students behind that. Yeah, that's a way to do that things. I think uh, when the question was asked to uh, Pei Zhu about what to tell to the next generation, I think one thing that we always did was go to a place that we feel least comfortable or move away from anything, that, any place that you start to think, ah, I get it, I know how it works, it becomes a stable condition. And we're trying to always destabilize basically our own uh, condition because I think we, we can um, trust uh, our own human uh, creativity and maybe ingenuity and, and I think as soon as you start repeating things because that's the way they are being done um, it, you become actually more vulnerable than than searching for the you know the unknown and the and the unstable so I do think it's not that we that we do these things uh, just because we want to um, do it different <laughs> but we actually feel that by going there we will find something uh, new <laughs> are, are we allowed one more question? Yes. Yeah, we're already deep in the red here, I see. But. My question uh, follows up on this. Um, you started out in 2008, the crisis went out, and I feel uh, I started also practicing then. Um, I feel many uh, clients also threw away all possible risk. And like everybody said, your projects are all one-offs, all new. How do you convince your clients to take the risk with you? Do you think you've been lucky with clients or you just take uh, not uh, like institutional clients who would be more risk adverse? How do you deal with this process? Um. We also teach, and I always tell my students that um, to hire an architect is one of the you know, most uh, uh, difficult decisions a client has. It's it, it, like the, 
people don't build uh, a lot. Well, you have institutional builders, but many um, uh, uh, clients, they, it's a very big um, choice, right? And there's a big responsibility, and, and they you know, are going to spend a number of years with you, and they're going to spend a substantial amount of money. And so you do uh, this question of trust and this question of engaging uh, risk uh, certainly uh, for a large part uh, depends also on the willingness of the client to engage um, in something like that. We, um, I think the, the project in Korea is a good example of uh, finding a client who is uh, very uh, wonderful and um, uh, open to engaging um, in this exploration because she works with contemporary artists and she understands that maybe sometimes you you have to move forward without knowing what the um, what the output will be uh, but we also take on risk uh, ourselves and so in the case of that building for instance we, she well there was a few things one is first of all we we made sure that the building would work without the skin right so this is one thing where we did you know, she wanted to be comfortable that the building would work despite, you know, if, if we would succeed or fail with the creation of this, uh, this envelope. At the same time, she gave us a budget and we said, well, we'll make it for that budget. So it was actually up to us to, to deliver um, to that number and anything that we would go over would actually be our, at our own uh, 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 responsibility. The, the MoMA installation as well, we were fully liable for the safety of people in that installation. So there we take, took on the risk uh, ourselves. MoMA did not take any risk. Uh, I will show you the contract that we had uh, there. <laughs> so I think it is a combination of, of a willingness to you know, um, uh, take on risk and at the same time communicate clearly and, and try to work with the people that are sharing the risk uh, with you. Yeah, and I, I would also add that I think a lot of uh, um, our generation, you know, it's very competitive, it's globalized, the market. So, um, you know, any, at any given moment you enter a competition, it's like 500 other people competing for the same job. And then, you know, I feel like a lot of people are trying to convince the client with images and like, you know, a finite kind of a product which you come up with in two months and that's not actually true that you can say to anyone that you can deliver that project in that form. So what we found in our experience, the best is to really gain the trust from the client in the relationship, that they would, uh, uh, they would trust us that we will work with them all the way, you know, we'll be remain open-minded and flexible, and uh, we will find it the best, you know, uh, collaborators, we'll find it the best engineer, we'll find it, a, you know, best contractor, and we'll make this process uh, the best as we can so that in the end we don't know, we cannot promise you in the first two months what it's going to be, but we can promise you that we'll do our best to, you know, make sure that, you know, in a way, you know, I think, you know, more than the competitions, I think the relationship building has been very important to us in gaining that trust from the clients. Last question. Um, I, I know both of you are educators. Um, can you talk about how your academic life, uh, your life with students teaching, and uh, the experiences you have with them contribute to your practice? Yeah. Um, what is interesting, so we, you know, I was educated in the Netherlands, then went to Japan, and we ended up in the East Coast, and, and, and Jing had a, had a sort of a similar but different uh, track. Um, what is very interesting about the education in the United States is that there is a lot of talking about architecture and there's not so much doing of architecture so um, actually, <laughs> well uh, but it actually really forces you to, to you know think and rethink your project and it helped us very much uh, or it forced us to to you know think much more precise maybe um, um, in this idea of the, the project of architecture so in that sense it was it, the, the helpful thing of teaching is that it is continuously confronting you with your own work because you you know you're actually relaying um, um, thoughts and so it, it forces you to to articulate those um, and obviously uh, I would say so now we have eight people working for us most of them are uh, students of ours uh, that we've worked with you know when they were students um, and they they've come into the office and we learn a ton about uh, um, new ways of thinking new software new you know the, the really um, I think the um, the generation that is completely digital um, has affected not just the way we work but also the way we think about 
the relationships be that, that people have with one another. So it's, it's ongoing and we both, um, I think, spent maybe a little bit less than half of our time teaching. Uh, but it is, it's very, very much part of, uh, it forces us, us to think and it, and it, yeah, it helps us uh, think. We, we are way deep over. into the red. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Ten minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. Thank you, um, all of you. Uh, next, uh, I would like to invite Kun Pichai Wong Wai Siyawan again uh, to present uh, Mr. Florian Eidenberg and Mrs. Jing Lu, uh, a token of appreciation. Also, Kun Superpon. All right, thank you for joining us today, and tomorrow we will have another uh, three sessions, which are Kunduang Rit Munak Naha. Another one uh, by Wasa Perovic. And the last one, uh, I think, is a um, very famous uh, kind of new trend of architecture, quite famous in fact. Pui Fang Ajan Jiu, can bang Nakap, Hua, Kru Hong Lao, Loko, Loko Lap, a light even international, Velao Nakap, Yahai Ajan Jiu, Kajan Patom Tan Nao Nakap, Kam Pui Fang Noon, Loko Kai Pensamachiko by Asa Club. นะครับแล้วก็ไปช่วยเป็นกำลังใจให้กับบรมคูของเราด้วยขอบคุณครับ